Hi, welcome to what we are calling Classic Bookmark. When we started shooting these interviews in the spring of 1988, we had no idea the show would go on for 30 years with over 400 episodes. To celebrate and mark this achievement, we have selected 15 shows. Choosing was difficult. Most of the writers chosen, like Horton Foote and Ray Bradbury, are deceased. Others, like Toni Morrison, the Nobel Prize winner, are perfectly well, but I do not think we will be lucky enough to have them on the show again. We purposely did not include some bookmark favorites like Rick Bragg, Winston Groom, Cena Jeter Naslin, Brad Watson, Daniel Wallace, Michelle Richmond, and others, since we plan to visit with them regularly in the future. Viewers will notice that the technology has improved considerably in 30 years. We have cleaned these up the best we could. These first 30 years have been a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy watching these as much as I did making them. Now the author of 11 volumes of fiction, Barry Hanna makes his home in Faulkner's Oxford, Mississippi. His forthcoming novel is Sick Soldier at Your Door. I spoke with Barry Hanna on campus at the University of Alabama. Barry, thank you. It's nice to see you again. Thank you for coming in. It's a, it's a big pleasure to be back at, uh, <laughs> at Alabama, which has uh, furnished me a lot, a lot of life and uh, a lot of a lot of friends. I mean, I I I, I felt very str very uh, close last night driving by Hill University, and uh, mm -hmm. it's just it's fun to be older in that way because you get to um, take in uh, a nostalgia even when things were not always pleasant. I mean, they're close. They're close and they're meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. What were you? What were your years here? I've forgotten. It's something like seventy four to early eighty or seventy nine, something right. like that. Right. Yeah. Well, those uh, were those were good. Those were good years for you, in professionally well, they were. too. Uh, yes, it's, uh, was, uh, of, uh, it was was a very vivid time because yeah. uh, the the faculty had a lot. There was a lot of personality to the faculty. I, it, it was a cast, you know, like an ensemble. You could look back, and you know, you you, you don't want it to happen, but it could, it could be. A series on an English department because of their, there was a constant drama. There was somebody either being fired, or losing it somehow, or or, 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 or running away, eloping, uh, or threatening someone else, and. It was kind of like uh, the Wild West meets high culture or something, you know? It, it, yeah. Those were uh, dramatic times, yeah. melodramatic right, times. Right, right. For you, you had come to town, you had published Geronimo Rex, you had published Night Watchman. Night Watchman, yeah. And then here, did you write Airships and Ray here in town? Uh, yeah, um, uh, no, not all. Some of them wrote Middlebury College, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the uh, testimony of Pilot was somebody. Some people think it's the best thing I ever did. I'd hate to mm -hmm. admit that. That was seventy eight. Uh, uh, but I wrote it in a blizzard up at uh, be, being nos very nostalgic uh, uh, for the South. And uh, but then mainly, yes. Yeah, and S S S Tuscaloosa was the base, the uh, ground zero for that book. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Well, I was going to save this till later because it's one of those questions you, you want to have most of the show done before you ask it, but I'll jump ahead anyway. All right. You were never an, a, an air, a Navy aircraft <laughs> carrier pilot. No. Right? No. But there was a time, I remember vividly, when you could talk about being a pilot so yeah. convincingly that pe actual pilots that you would talk to right. were convinced that you'd been there. Now, 
Now, time has passed, and you don't exactly do that anymore. Were you? What were you doing? Were you channeling a I was dead chan yeah, pilot? A, what, what were you doing? That's a good thing. I, I don't know. For, for one thing, it's pathetic. Uh, it's even if you, you write books, you know, and people like them and all, that's not enough. I mean, I, I was, you're always trying to be something not sedentary. And I see, <laughs> And Vietnam was going on, and my best friend, John Quisenberry gave me all those facts about f flying a Phantom. He was in the war, and mm -hmm. I I felt so close. And especially if I were drinking, I would I would just adopt that role because I think I was tired of being literary. I, frankly, I was just mm -hmm. tired of being a book person, mm -hmm. and so uh, it's it, it was boyish and stupid. Uh, but I, I don't. It's not unusual for someone uh, to displease themselves all the time. That, that you, you have not done enough, and so you, you do some shape shifting. You yeah, know? I, I wonder. What do you think about this as an idea that that when people are in the th absolute throes of writing fiction, yeah, that the that line between reality and <clears throat> Myth just fades away because yes, that's what I think I saw. Well, you did, uh, uh, and I, I, I did deliver a hell of a lot of myself to everything I touched in that book, airships, mm -hmm. and, and and everything I've done pretty much. I mean, nothing has been a laboratory experiment. I, I don't even know what experiment means. It's just from the gut, and I. Uh, I predicted my own life in airships. I mean, I, sadly, you become what you write. So I got superstitious. I didn't write about, say, the death of a child or something like that. Uh, because in the next five or six years, everything I wrote is as if I almost had to become and I go through the misery to earn, you know, the book or something. It's a carrier, as you say, it's... You live right next to your characters, and sometimes you enter them. Mm -hmm. And you live a lot of lives. And uh, it was a, an age that was funny for me. I, I, I wanted to be a hippie, but I had to work too hard. I couldn't be a hippie. I had a wife, children. And uh, so I, I was missing a lot, you know? I was missing a lot of life. A professor... That's a certain life, but I was missing a, a, a lot of, I got married too early, I was missing a lot of bachelorhood, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and recovering lost time. So I'm not excusing myself I, 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 and for, for entering my characters, but it's, you've got to watch out or you will predict your own misery. I love Beckett, but I, I know in no way did I ever want to live out the, the agony of his plays. And yet he gets it so he so he is wonderful and deep when you understand suffering. I mean, and and, and the small tiny movements and a little vivid pen, a pencil, paper, uh, a pebble, a bicycle, these t just a little few possessions, and no progress at all, and suffering. No, no. Very static. And so I, you understand that Beckett is about that. He was a depressed man, uh, very modest, but uh, he wrote himself out of depression somewhat w with his work. And uh, his fame fell on him just very accidentally almost. And uh, I didn't know why I loved Beckett so much for a long time. And then I found out through living that the man, he knows what the hell life is. It's, we're not going anywhere. We're going. We we are crawling through the day, you know, and the rest of us pretend that life is a great adventure most of the time, and it's often a lie. It's 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 a tall tale. Uh, so he risked a lot because he didn't have a lot of big readership. No, you know, not for ages. And so I don't, I risk sometimes in my writing. I'm sure a popular reception, such as my student Bob Inman had. You know, because I I didn't write heartwarming things very much. Um, Bob's good at heartwarming, good stuff. Sells a lot of books. Sells a lot of books. He's a good man, too. Uh, 
but he, he works TV and Bob can entertain. He knows an audience, mm -hmm. uh, a different from mine. I never had an audience, never had an audience. So I just wrote, you know, straight mm -hmm. out. Yeah. If you know. if you if if the world had been organized so that you could have read your work aloud more, even more than you did, you would have sold a million books because the, your work never is better. It's never better than when you're reading it. It's that's that's when the Thank audience you. Well, that's gets high it. Praise. But when you got done being a, a a jet pilot, carrier pilot, you became a doctor. That's another person <laughs> for a, for a while, didn't you? Yeah, what was I, it about I, I, medicine I, I, that again, grabbed you? Again, I don't forgive myself. It's still uh, it's pathetic. Uh, it's it's just something uh, again that you you want to be a. a an MD because a writer is not enough. It mm -hmm. just seems a little wimpy sometimes, a little passive. You want to be in a position where you have actually helped people or maimed them in a serious way. <laughs> and those uh, books, the ones yeah. we, the ones we're talking about at the, at present, those fell under the eyes of Gordon Lish. And recently, yeah. Tess Gallagher has been writing about the way that Gordon Lish treated Raymond Carver manuscripts. Carving away big chunks, reducing it, I, either reducing it to the essence or injuring it, whichever, whichever side you come down on. Gordon Lish was your editor for yeah. several years. Did he uh, do a lot of cutting and, and pasting with your work? And if so, what was your, what'd you feel about it? He did cutting, not pasting so much. Uh, sure he did. Uh, and helped. Mostly he was, of, of, he was right. He, Gordon likes the echo rather than the exposition. That's simply it. He, mm -hmm, he, he mm -hmm. likes the echo, and Good. he likes the white space. Uh, and at that time in my life, I, I, uh, he taught me how to write short stories. I, by publishing under Gordon, I was learning how to write as I was publishing in Esquire. So mm -hmm. I owe the man hugely. Uh, and he shaped Ray also, which I didn't... I had no idea what Ray was. Uh, it was just a book, a, a series of explosions and, and um, of time travel almost, but to, to different eras. A man lost in history and making a horrible botch of the present, maybe because he's lost in history. Um, but I... I I, I don't know how much he edited Ray. I know Ray was alarmed once when he when he he didn't want this information out so thoroughly because he he didn't even seem to be the auteur. I mean, it's as if Gordon had directed and was Ray Carver. Yeah. So your, your novel Ray, because this is good. Yeah, right. This gets pretty confusing. Your novel Ray. What what percentage, if if you can remember, is a long time ago. I know, but how much longer was it? When he, when he when Gordon Lish got it into his hands, did he did he drop away twenty five percent fifty? I would say I, it is hard to remember. Sure, uh, there's no reason why I can't give you an honest answer. Uh, but I mean, I have no motives uh, right. lying or nothing to gain by telling the truth or lying. I, I it was a, a let's say a, a book again, like mm -hmm. it's so short, one hundred and ten, one hundred twenty pages. Yeah, uh, probably cut in half. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. When your characters travel through time, and when they have these little slippages when, they, when they're in another, they almost always are in a Civil War skirmish. They, that is the place that your character's mind will click to and back right. from. Civil War, I mean, I know you're a Mississippi boy and, and a good Southerner, but what, what is it about the Civil War that has drawn you back over and over? That's right. Uh, at the time when I was at Ar uh, Alabama, I wanted to write a, a novel about Jeb Stewart. Yeah, he was such a contradiction. He was the last of the Cavaliers, but he was also Presbyterian. Didn't drink or smoke, and the blacks loved him. He had a, his own banjo man who played in the saddle with him. Yeah. So there was love and a complex soldier, uh, the last great horse general, and. He's, he you know, was killed at Yellow Tavern, and he sort of was the emblem to me of what the, the South was. It won with dash and absolute courage, and loss were the same thing. But I think it, some, some serious military historians say it fought with less 
and better than even the Nazis. It's, it's a shame that we were on the bad side mm -hmm. because the, for, for that amount of food and that amount of ammunition, uh, that, that much area to cover, it was uh, a phenomenal, uh, gruesome, long battle. Uh, our Vietnam, <laughs> except we were, you know, like north south, and yeah. tore the hell out of us. Yeah. So uh, lately, let's see if I've if, if I've traveled back. Uh, in um, one of my favorite stories that I've done uh, uh, is from Bats Out of Hell. The Bats Out of Hell division mm -hmm. is a kind of parody of of how the Old South got its, the Lost Cause got its romance. Right. James Stewart yeah. may fit into the beau ideal. He may be the right. the, the creature, the carrier pilot, the MD, lifesaver, yeah. He's everything the I wanted to be. Sure. He's a, boyish. He's, boy, he's everything everybody he's wants to be. He's a boyhood hero. <laughs> now, let you me know. tell you something I've noticed reading, lately, reading back through a bunch of books that I'd enjoyed in the past. The Story Water Liars at Forte Cove. Yeah, Forte Cove. <laughs> right. If you think so. Right. That spot, that cove, that dock, that pond, lake, you keep using it. You keep using that place, and you've returned to it. You've written a whole novel on the shores of that right, spot. Right, you understand your orphan. You right. understand your orphan. But it keeps reappearing, that spot. That spot has become something... Um, a token or something for you. You return to it many times. What's so yeah. magic about Farte Cove? Well, it has all the things I, you I need. Can, you know, this is post uh, post modern thinking. I, I but I, I'm not. I'll tell you what I am as a late modernist about mm -hmm. anything. I, mm -hmm. I have not. I've never known what post modern means except you're alive, and Faulkner's dead. That's all it means to me. And. But they were my models, Ray and, I mean, uh, uh, Faulkner and Hemingway, Flannery O'Connor. Mm -hmm. uh, but about that spot, I mean, the the the, 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 the earth is about uh, two-thirds water. And water is always a mystery and a beautiful one to me. You know, savagery right underneath the waves. And I like the old men out there who, who are at the end of their lives. What are people, how do you act when you're dying? Do you lie a lot? Do you, do you come across uncomfortable <laughs> truths more? Yeah. Uh, and now, you know, that I'm in my uh, mid-60s, uh, bidding for 70 in about five years, I don't have to pr imagine anymore. I have, You know, I, I talked about these people with their infirmities hobbling out. There are days when I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm one of them. I So I found as a, as a lad and that, that it, and all peers in Florida... Alabama has great waters. I'm a fisherman. Uh, the, people, people ask, what, what is the sport in throwing a piece of wood with hooks on it to hook something stupid and reptilian? Where, where's the huge glamour? It makes people millionaires, these giant boats, for that one big black bass. And uh, black bass, by the way, was on a legal exercise. My friend Quisenberry told me about He's a lawyer now. And it was in profiling abuse of wives. And one of the questions was, is he a bass fisher? <laughs> <laughs> is that, that raises the possibility. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, so but, but the water is magic. That's plain. Everybody thinks that uh -huh. it is, just about. It's never frightened me. I grew up on the coast in, in Long Beach and Bay St. Louis. Yeah. I grew up in, with kind of salt water in my veins. Also next to Vicksburg. So you can see that these things are easy. Right. Uh, and natural for for my backyard. Well, let's um, not let's not let time pass without talking about your newest. Um, you you have a book coming out within what a few months? Four well, or five months? It, it'll probably it maybe a year now. I've, 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 I'm re redoing a whole voice of it this summer. What know? is it? It's called Sick Soldier at Your Door, and it's it's about something you all are familiar with in Alabama. And while I was writing this book, and long after I started it, you had to. Well, those are the students who, who torched about nine or ten churches. Yes. Remember that? Sure. Birmingham Southern Boys right. or something? Just a couple years ago. And, I mean, they were privileged. They claimed they were drunk. But you don't burn ten churches when you're just drunk. I've been drunk a lot. I had burned one church. <laughs> and uh, there's something else that you'll never hear 
going on with those kids. And they were all Baptist and rural, you know, mm -hmm. uh, black or white. This uh, six soldiers about Iraqi veterans in Oxford, Mississippi. It's my first Oxford book. Of course, you're leery of an Oxford book because Faulkner stamped around there so deeply. And But I'm old enough now to take it on in my way. There are church burnings going on in the lower Mississippi Valley all the way uh, from the Delta to Oxford up through Memphis to St. Louis. Mosques, synagogues, tabernacles. Mm -hmm. This is affirmative action burning. No, no, the denomination doesn't matter. And that's the mystery. Who's burning it? And I have a kind of return of Ray. A, a Ray could be a Ray son. He, he fought in the Navy on a carrier in, in Iraq. Uh -huh. Okay. 2000, I mean, 1991. A, day, a year vivid for when my daddy died. I remember seeing it had the eeriness of Iraq being bombed, that television. Mm -hmm. C CNN, you know. CNN live, was live. Right, live. Yeah. Uh, what, um, and they said that Saddam was hiding watching his favorite show, Little House on the Prairie. He would cry. <laughs> so he was watching Little House on the Prairie and crying because he didn't have a father and, and, and tearing up. Well, we, we're televising these people <laughs> who are bombing the hell out of him. Um, so these Iraqis come, these veterans come back. It's a natural, because I've talked to the boys who went over there, both of them messed up. They went over there to build schools, churches, hospitals. They received fire, and they had to return it. Mm -hmm. And you're not made to do that. They were not trained. Only the lunatics are, like General Petraeus told that he's a bad reporter, about the Marines he was he, and the Army boys that he was taking along with the tanks. You understand that I'm in command of the, mo the most insane youth in America. <laughs> yeah. I, before we, so, before we part, <laughs> I want to talk about Oxford and Ole Miss. Yeah, what, right. What a, what a situation. What, you had it at one, and I, very specifically, there was a moment, I was told, this is in the literary world, a moment when you and Willie Morris and John Grisham and Larry Brown would all be together in an evening yeah. having, a, having a Coke. Right. And what, did Donna Tart actually come and, and take a kind of informal instruction from for the finest writers in the world. Is that true? Oh, no. Well, well she's one of the <laughs> finest writers in the world. Thank you. Uh, bless Willie and Larry. I sure miss them. I'll uh, bet. No, John never taught. And Willie uh, Willie taught Donna, I think, in journalism. He, called, he said, Barry, I got a genius for you. Yeah. So I taught her one semester, and then she got a scholarship to Bennington. Yeah. She, so she was a freshman writer in my grad class who was out writing all the graduates. I've... I don't meet anybody like that anymore. She, I mean, she was knew, a freshman. Yeah, she was. A, she knew French symbolist writers. Yeah, her, yeah. Elliot intimately right. when she was eighteen, and so d d she all she needed was subject matter, and she got it off that Bennington campus, and and that, that's one of the only successful academic books I've ever read. That the secret history. The secret is history. First rate. First rate. Well, I wasn't really imagining so much. Uh, Donna Tartt as a, the student of U4, as I was Donna Tart sort of partaking of the of the writerly, <clears throat> what, place, atmosphere. Well, well, she may have profited from that, Don, because I, as I understood it, she, her, either her father or stepfather made fun of her for, for being interested in poetry. So she saw that the, that you could live and, and uh, have some dignity or if she needed any more confidence. But Donna made herself, make no mistake. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, they've been, I think Vanity Fair interviewed me saying, are you a star maker? No, hell no. She passed through my class. I was lucky enough to be in the room with her. <laughs> she was on the way. They're the ones that are going to do something. They come there with a hell of a lot. Yeah. You know? That generation, the Willie, Larry, John Grisham, and you, has given way now to Tom Franklin, we, we've Beth given up. We're and, not given up, but we've given away. And Jack Pendarvis. <laughs> right. You've got a new game. I hire these people. Uh, yeah. I, I, so I want the youth to take it away. I think Jack Pendarvis is a marvelous wit. Uh, I do, too. I mean, just first yeah. rate. 
He's a smash at Oxford. I mean, they love his class. He's never taught in his life. Mm -hmm. He's done TV work. For right. ad, ad for TV, it was miserable. So yep. we give him a Grisham Fellowship, and I believe he's going to be an Oxford citizen and teach a little more for us. That's exactly what I was going to ask you next. His contract expires, and when I spoke with him, I said, what are you going to do next? And he said, I'm going to stay here. Right, it's a good he's, place. It's a good place to live. And we need him. I think we, we, uh, we had a, a fellow leave the MFA faculty, so we're going to use Jack uh, over there uh, because he was such a smash natural teacher, too. And do you, things must be quieter than they used to be. These, this, this new generation is not raising the kind of hell that no, Willie and, and Larry and you raised. No, they don't. I kind of miss <laughs> hell raisers. I, I miss the hell raising student body. They only hell, they raise hell in football, which I'm also crazy about. But mm -hmm. I'll have to admit that the student body is really. Uh, boring the hell out of me at this point. I, I, I'm, I'm the wildest guy in the room, and it shouldn't be that way. You know, I, I shouldn't be surprising 22 years old or people with stuff I do. They sh you know, they were, should be the ones out there doing it. And they always, I mean, it's not that they don't care, but who knows what they care about. Even when you ask them, what's your favorite book? That throws them into confusion. <laughs> You know, it's just a different, I don't know if everybody's turned Republican and stayed. Things are uh, quieter than what? they used to be. It's, I think uh, political it's not correctness has won out. <laughs> it's not exciting enough. Uh, getting drunk on beer, I mean, it, and ecstasy, it, it's just about it. Yeah. You know, I, it, uh, I guess old, old men always like to put down, you know, well, there's no hope for youth. Well, Good, and we're right. We're right, right. right. <laughs> But in an MFA program, you get to you get to see the ones that punch through that, the ones right. that, that kept their own ID. Okay. Yeah. Barry, thank you. you I have, bet. I've looked forward to this conversation for a long time, and it well, has been a pleasure. Well, you're a sweet uh, doyen of, of us, uh, as we know, all the help we can get done. You're entirely welcome. Thank you. Thank you.